Frank, man, there is there is there is just red flags all over your email, brother. And I, I want to help you. Any girl that says that she can't marry you or accept a proposal because it's not the exact ring that she wanted is not the exact girl that you need. What's up, everybody? Welcome back in. Thanks for listening to the podcast. I've been running like crazy. This is uh, this is typical of this time of year, doing a lot of fairs and festivals and concerts around the country that are not just on the weekends, but we've been playing a lot of Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. And so finding time to do the podcast has been interesting, but I still absolutely love coming in here and answering y'all's questions. It's one of my favorite things to do of all the things that I do. If you want your question answered, email grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. We'll put it in the queue. You could ask about any topic and we'll talk about it in long form, like we're just sitting around a campfire. I have a few requests. Don't send the same question twice. It'll get deleted and don't make it too much longer than a phone length. Otherwise, it makes it more difficult to read. Uh, but other than that, it's open game. You could ask me about anything, and we have heard over the last uh, 100 episodes or so that uh, the subjects are very, very different, and I love them. So I'm going to dive in here before I say anything else, because that's not what this podcast is about. It's about you. First question, subject line, it says healing. It says, hey, Granger, my name is Connor. Today, exactly one year ago, my wife left me. No explanation or reason. She just left. We were high school sweethearts and together since 16 years old. I'm 26 now. It's been the worst year of my life. I've struggled mentally and physically. Within one month, I lost 30 pounds. I didn't want to live anymore. I tried hurting myself, tried to give up, but God kept me here. I know God's timing is perfect and to stay patient, but every day, especially today, is so hard I'm trying so hard to heal. I've moved from West Virginia to Florida to start my life over again. I'm making new friends, plugging myself into a church as much as I can, working so hard on my relationship with Christ, but it feels as though I'm just going in circles. I want to move on, but I'm afraid that I won't be able to love someone the same or more than I ever loved her. Any advice would be appreciated. Love what you do. Uh, This question comes from Connor. Connor, uh, man, thank you for emailing. I'm so sorry that this is this is the day this is the the anniversary of the toughest day of your life and it's not a surprise that you know as humans we look at the calendar and we start relating things to good and bad events in our life and you could for instance you could be um as i'm reading this it's the month of june and you could look at the month of june and say you know the weather's getting hot the the trees look a certain way. Um, there's certain things going on in, in work. Um, I'm wearing the similar clothes that I was wearing, all relating back to the day that she left. And so it's it's easy to see that you can make those correlations as opposed to um, colder weather and it's snowing outside. There's not as much of a of a of a correlation there. So I, I say that to in a way to validate that. Of course, this hurts. No one's going to blame you. Of course, you're having these feelings on this day. Uh, of course, you're still struggling. This is someone you you made a vow to spend the rest of your life with, and you you knew her for a, ten years, and that that is over. You are grieving that loss. This heartbreak is equal to grief for you. It's it's just as though she died, and. No one is going to deny that, and no one is ever going to take that away from you. So your 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 pain and your hurt and your heartbreak is valid. But what I want to dive into, just from reading your question one time, uh, I want to dive into something here that's interesting. And anyone listening could could take this with a grain of salt for their own situation that they're in. But there's one sentence you said that's interesting. It says. I'm working so hard on my relationship with Christ, but it feels as though I'm going in circles. I want to move on, but I'm afraid. Let's just take that little piece right there. This is 
th- th- this is normal for you to say it. I'm not surprised that you said it, but I want to point out that this is not Christianity. That's this is not what the Bible says. Interesting, right? You're like, what? What do you mean? That's not what the Bible says. I'm working so hard on my relationship with Christ, and it feels like I'm going in circles. I want to move. That's not what it says to us. There, there is nothing in your relationship with Christ, with God. It is, it's never about working, works, acts, effort at all. Your effort is irrelevant, right? We're talking about your salvation. We're talking about your peace and joy and hope. We're not talking about the result of your relationship. So, so as the relationship is established, the result of that is going to convict you to walk into the good works that have been prepared for you. But it is not the requirement of the relationship. Jesus says, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. Meaning, nothing you could do, work-related, is going to, to, going to draw you to Jesus. That's God. The Father will do that. It's an interesting concept, and the reason I say it, because you might be saying, well, what do I do? So now I tell you. So here it is. Get a pen and paper. Write this down. There's one word I have to tell you that, that's going to relate to you in your situation, in this terrible divorce, this terrible suffering, and in any kind of hardship or anxiety or tribulation or adversity of any kind. There's one word for you. Surrender. Surrender it. Give it to God. God, this is what your, this is what a prayer would look like. God, I am hurting. I am in so much pain. I I have I've tried this and I've tried this and I've tried to get closer to you and I've tried to establish my relationship with you and I've tried to go to church and and I've I've tried to um, get gain some of the weight back that I lost and I'm trying to eat healthy and I'm trying to exercise and I and I'm trying to meet other people and I'm trying to meet other girls and I'm trying I'm trying I'm trying and guess what I can't do it I can't. My heart is still attached to her. I'm hurting. There's nothing I can do anymore. So God, I can't do it. Take this from me. I surrender all of this to you. It's like it's like you're going down a river, Connor, and you're you're in a raft and you're hitting rapids. And you're just paddling, 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 paddling. And sometimes it works. Sometimes you get around a, a boulder. And then there's a, a tree that fell down in the water and it's causing these rapids and you, you come up to the tree and you, you like you use all the strength you can with your oars and you barely make around it, get it and then here comes a curve and it's it's really sharp and you make it around this cliff and you're you're still paddling, you're getting tired and you're just fighting, fighting, fighting the current. And then guess what? Around the next curve, there's a waterfall. And nothing you can do could stop you from getting to that waterfall and going off and your boat is done. Your oars are gone. That's what's happened to you. You've tried to control your boat. And let me tell you, I'm telling you this from experience. I'm actually writing a book about this right now. You're listening to a guy that has tried so hard his whole life to guide his boat with his oars and his own strength including my relationship with God, thinking that I could paddle, if I paddle hard enough, I'll get close enough to God as though I'm trying to get to him. It's like he, he's off in the distance and I've got my boat and my paddles and I'm like, if I, if I could just get closer to God, if I could just get through these rapids and all these obstacles and around these corners and these twists and turns, if I could just get closer to him, then I'll feel peace. And I'll feel less anxiety and I'll feel hope. And that's just not. I'm telling you from experience, that's not what the Bible says. And it also doesn't work. One word, surrender. I'm talking on your knees, Connor. God, I can't, I can't do it. I've tried. I can't move on. My heart is still attached. Detach this heart. Enlarge it to you. Make you my desire, not her. I can't 
seem to get my heart away from her. I'm stuck. What do I do? God, take it. You built my heart. You created my heart. My heart is in your hands. So twist it and turn it back towards you. Make her memory seem like poison to me because I can't take it anymore. That's the prayer over and over and over again, Connor. Every night on your knees, sincere. And as he starts to do it, as he starts to take your heart and remold it, because guess what? Guess what he wants? This surrender. He wants you at a place where you're so broken, you can't save yourself anymore. And then he comes in and goes, oh, did you try to save yourself? Now you need a savior because you couldn't? Now I got you. Now you're in the place I could work with you. Now your heart is in a position when I could use it to worship me. And when you worship me, when you praise me, when I save you and you praise me, you'll finally understand joy. You'll finally understand gratitude and love and peace. I'm telling you, Connor, from experience, surrender. Stop trying. Stop working working on friends, working on church, working on forgetting her, working, working, working. And on a side, little side thing, you're praying, give it to him. Now, the result of that, the result of that surrender is your works, not the beginning, not the start of it. The result, the end result of this surrender, you're going to notice yourself craving church craving godly things, craving to want to read the Bible, craving want to want to obey the commandments of the gospel. But you can't do those things because you're a sinner and so am I. And that's the way we're wired. We're rebels. But once you surrender, now you're ready to then live a life according to the gospel. Give it all to him. I'm so sorry for your loss. I cannot personally relate to that loss. But I know it hurts, man. And I also know after the surrender, on the other side of that surrender, there's a new girl, there's a new life, there's hope. And yes, to answer your last question, there is someone that you will love more. Absolutely. Let's go to something else here. This this is a subject line question, finding the right person to marry. Hey, Granger, I've been listening to your podcast for a while now. And the question I have that I struggle with is this. How do I know this is for sure the girl I want to spend the rest of my life with? I'm 20 years old. I've been dating this girl for coming close to a year now. We have a lot of great times that we've had together. But there are some small things that still make me unsure if this is who I want to spend the rest of my life with. Got any advice? The question comes from Bo. Bo, thanks for the email, buddy. Um, it, great question. And, and it's, it's a really good question to be thinking about because this means, this tells me that you're not so involved with your heart and thinking with your heart, you're actually using your brain. And it's a really good time to be using your brain right before you're thinking about making a a really big decision about getting married. So first thing is you're 20. I'm assuming she's around the same age. That's that's young. Things are going to change by the time she's 30. If you're seeing things you don't like right now, hey, there's a chance that those could get you know, fixed. There's also a chance, equal amount of chance there that those things that you don't like are going to be 10 times worse by the time she's 30 and you're 30. The fact that you're seeing red flags, not it's not a deal breaker that you're seeing red flags, but it's something to think about. And so you need an action for this. And I would say, me, I like to, I'm a visual guy, I like to write things out. So I would say, Bo, make a list of the, the top unnegotiable things that you want from a wife. And then make another list of the the unnegotiable things that are deal breakers for a future spouse. And these things are up to you. And I can't put these words in your mouth. Only you know you. But it's it's things like children. You want children? How many do you want? And how important is that on your priority list? That's a big deal to talk about. Your faith. Where are you in your faith? Is that important to you? Should that be important to her? It's a big, really big conversation piece. Um, your career. 
what what are you expecting her to be accepting of your career? And what do you expect from her out of her career or not a career? Do you expect her to be a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home nothing? Or do you expect her to bring home half of the income? Do you expect her to bring home all the income? I don't know. That's up to you. But these are things to really think about before engagement. And you got to think with your brain and not your heart. The fact that you're 20 means you have a lot of time. And it's not a big deal if you want to separate from her for a little bit and say, hey, I think we need a break. Oh my gosh, what do you mean? I, yeah, just, I need a break. I'm stepping into a time in my life when I'm, I'm going to have to make some really, really big decisions of, of spending the rest of my life with someone. And I'm by no means saying this isn't you, but I really want to kind of go over some things in my life and make sure I'm ready for that person, which is hopefully you. You know, you could do anything you want, but but um, I would write it out. And I would I would ask some of your friends, like your friends, the counsel around you is so valuable and we rarely use it in a, in a relationship sense. I would go to your parents. I would go to your friends and say, what do you think about her? Be totally honest. Shoot me straight. What do you think about her? Do you think she's she's my wife, my future wife? And let them tell you and make them be honest. And then when they start saying things like, man, Bo, I didn't ever want to tell you, man, but I, I don't... I don't know, like, there's some red flags she has, and she says some things when you're not around, and I've seen her doing this and that when you're out of town, and, and Bo, I just don't, I don't think so, man. Then you got to listen to them. You don't have to make a decision because of them, but you have to weigh their their opinion deeply into your decision. And then maybe some of them are going to say, man, she's great, dude. You're stupid if you don't wrap this up right now, put a ring on the finger. You are stupid if you don't do that. They might say that, but you need a consensus. Wise counsel is so important. Let me know how it goes, brother. Thanks for the email. Next question, subject line says, monster in law. Hey, Granger. I've been with my now fiance for over seven years. We have three kids together. Oh, excuse, let me start over. Together, we have three kids. Two of them are my stepdaughters. And his mom is evil, but only towards me. She's a phenomenal grandmother and mother to my fiance, but she's rude to me, blatantly makes, makes me feel bad for just existing, and makes it known that I come last to everyone. I've tried talking to her about it and many other things, but finally, I told my fiance that I'm just going to avoid her altogether. I have told him that I don't expect him to cut her out of his life, but I'm just going to keep my interactions with her minimal. I've prayed about this for years, and I'm just unsure of what to do or how to handle the situation. Thank you. Caitlin. Caitlin, tough situation. What makes this tough is that you have, uh, sounds like you guys have a child together and two of them, two other children that are his, and you've been together seven years. This makes it just complicated, complicated. And this is, if anyone's listening that's not in the situation, this is why, this is why, this is why you, it, it's so hard to have baby mamas out there and baby daddies, um, I have to say this, and Caitlin, this is not this is not directed to, towards you, but I have to say that you know when we read the Bible and we see we see guidelines laid out for us, it's not so that we don't have fun or we have a miserable life or we have to we have to be this this religious robot that just follows this this ridiculous structure. It's just not that. It's for our own good. It's for our own well being because we were created by, by a being that knows us better than we know ourselves. And so these, these guidelines are laid out. If you want to have a, a, a life that isn't, that, that, that isn't suffering beyond what normal life would be, follow these guidelines. And when you get out of the guidelines, you get monster-in-laws. And, 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 but this is, you're past this now, Caitlin. You know? So that's, that's why this, this is not on you. I don't say that to you at all. And it's, that comes without any judgment. I have my own problems for sure, but but the reason I I bring it up is because you need to understand your story is very very complicated, and it, there's not an easy fix to this because of, there's a lot of kids involved. Usually, when you see a monster in law that's being a monster towards the the new girl, the daughter, not the she's the mother of the son. 
I should say. Usually you see that because there is, there is, this is crazy. I'm willing to bet, Caitlin, that this monster-in-law has had man problems in her life. I'm willing to bet she's gone through multiple divorces or she's been cheated on and or abused physically, uh, verbally, something in that world. I'm, I'm willing to bet that she has been hurt by a man and she feels worth with herself through her son now because she is now raising a son and she feels the love that she needs from a man she feels that with her the relationship with her son and you are coming in and she ha- she has grown jealous of you because you're t- going to steal her man the man that the only man her son that hasn't let her down in her life i, c- I could be wrong on this but i'm i'm i would bet money that i'm right <laughs> You are coming in to steal the only man that hasn't left her yet or that hasn't abused her or or treated her with less dignity in some way. It's wild. This is wild psychiatry, and and I'm not not qualified to be speaking into psychiatry, but if you look at it from that lens, it will change a little bit of the way that you react to it. But the way that you shouldn't react to it at all is by showing hostility back to her. She is a a wounded animal and she's cornered. And when you, of course, she's going to bite back and she's going to scratch. And if you continue to keep her cornered and be aggressive back to her, to her, it's never going to fix anything. It's never like, she's never going to wake up in a couple years and go, Caitlin, after you guys have been arguing, Caitlin, I just want to say, I'm so sorry that I treated you wrong for so many years. I was wrong. Like that would be very, very rare for her to come to that realization. It's more likely for that to happen if you back off and you say, I am, I'm so sorry that I've been intruding into this family. And I just want to let you know that, that I love you. I think you're an incredible grandmother, phenomenal, as you said, and just such a great mother to my fiance. And I understand that you don't like me. And I just want to tell you that I forgive you and I, and I love you. And, and I hope that one day you could love me back. That's, that's my biggest hope. And if that's, I don't know how long that'll take, but I just want to let you know I'm here for the long haul. Like I'm here for your, your son and I'm here for our three kids. Two of them are stepkids and I'm here for, I'm here for them. I'm not going anywhere. You could trust me on that. And when you say that, when you see, you better be serious when you say that. When you say you could trust me on that, you better not back out on that. That would be bad. But that's the only approach you could take. That's it. You have you have one route. I mean, that's it. There's no other way. There's no there's no way that you could mentally beat her at a challenge or or punish her enough and make her finally realize that she's wrong. The only thing you can control, because you can't control her, is the way you react to her. How will you react to her? With love and forgiveness? or with, uh, with aggression back. I'm not saying you have to hang out every day with her. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing that you're backing off a little bit, but don't make it too obvious. Like, don't say, where's the Christmas party? Oh, it's with her? I ain't going. Don't be that. But you don't have to go to the Christmas party and be lovey on her the whole time. You could go and be cordial and polite and gracious and thankful, but you don't have to sit next, next to her on the couch, if that makes sense. Let's take a break and be right back. Hey, it's Granger Smith. Thank you for listening to my podcast. If you want to get a hold of me and get a personal video message from me, the best way to do it is cameo.com slash Granger Smith. You can get a birthday shout out, maybe an anniversary, an uplifting message, whatever you need for whoever you need it. It's super easy. You can either download the Cameo app and search for Granger Smith or just go to your URL and type in cameo.com slash Granger Smith. I'm always available to send you a personal video message. It's really easy. You type in exactly what you need me to say and for who you need me to say it to, and I'll get it shot over to you just in a few days. That's cameo.com slash Granger Smith, or download the Cameo app on your phone and search for Granger Smith. 
Okay, question subject line says, how do we make friends? It's in all caps and it has three explanation, exclamations, exclamations, excuse me. I don't talk for a living. Question says, hey, Granger, how long, I, I'm a long, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm not really good though on this break, am I? Hey, Granger, I'm a longtime listener, fan of the Smith channel and watcher for three years. My name is Chris. I'm 28 years old. We moved our family from Indiana to Bowling Green, Kentucky last year for a dream job as a trust designer. Our biggest downfall is making friends. And after a year, we still don't have a friend that we could just go to dinner with or have a game night with. How do we approach that in a new environment? Yeah, Chris, first of all, thanks for for listening and watching and, and checking out the Smiths and being a fan. And you are the heart and soul of Yee Nation, man. So I, I just, I appreciate you so much. And I think, I think it's a great question. It's a valid question. You took a dream job. Congratulations on that. And... You got to move and you get to ex- experience a whole new life. You get a reset and that's, that's amazing. And it's, it's understandable that, you know, you reset your whole life. You're like the new people in town and you're trying to make friends and you're 28. That's great. You're not 58. That's a little bit different. Uh, 28, this is, this is, uh, this is very doable. So, I'm trying to think. You said my family. I'm assuming you have kids because you said we moved our family. Yeah. So I'm assuming there's kids involved. Man, kids are a great way to make for parents to make friends with the other parents through um, sporting events or, or leagues or school or theater and plays and clubs and whatever the kids are involved with. You show up and you're kind of forced into these environments where you're with other parents that have something very much in common with you, a kid the same age as your kid at the same school or at the same sporting thing. Like that's, you, you got something in common. It's, it's a really good bond. And you're wanting more than that. I understand. And you're probably thinking we do that. And, and you're, wanting, you're wanting this to elevate into dinner and game nights. So, Another way to get to that is through the kids and and having them. Maybe maybe your kids are too young because you're only 28, but you're getting close. But having the kids when they become friends, and you invite people over to your house for the kids to play, but then you have some adult things to do too. So it's like, hey, could the kids come over and play on Friday night? And we got a slip and slide set up, and we're gonna have some ice cream and pizza. And for the adults, you know, we got some, we got a movie and some wine and, you know, whatever. And, and, and so it, it creates this environment where the kids come over and they're eating pizza and ice cream. And then, then the adults are having adult conversations and then friendships grow from there. Um, the other thing is your hobbies. Like, what do you do? Do you, do you like to hunt or fish or play golf or, or, play tennis or whatever, play flag football or softball, like what, whatever you might do, go do that stuff with you and your wife or alone. And as you go into finding these hobbies, you are going to meet people instantly with your same, same cravings, you know, like people, people, you show up and you go, Hey man, how long you been doing skeet shooting? I've been doing it for the last six years. How about you? I've been doing it about the same time. And uh, I come here on Wednesdays. Man, me too. Hey, we should we should do something other than this one night. You know, what does your wife like to do? You, you guys like to see movies? We, uh, we can get a movie and get one on Amazon and watch it on Friday if you want. Something like that. Like it's, it just starts off super casual. And then you might you know, and the wife might come over and then meet your wife and they don't like each other. <laughs> That's okay. That under, that happens. But it's a good start, right? Um, you know me. You know I'm going to say church is a great way to make friends. Finding the local church that you like, getting involved, plugging into that, serving with the church. So you're, um, you're in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So say there's a there's a big storm, that a tornado. There was just a tornado, right? A big tornado in Kentucky. So say a big tornado rolls through. And our church here in Austin actually uh, sent a crew to and some money to help with the Kentucky tornado. 
And so as that happens with you and you get together and you serve the community, say there's there's a tornado comes through and there's there's limbs down everywhere in a neighborhood and there's old ladies, widows, and the, and a tree, trees have gone down in their yard and you're going to get out there with some chainsaws with your church and you're going to cut up some of these limbs that fell down in the old lady's yard that needs help and she's out there crying and saying thank you. But guess what? Guess what? A result of that, too, like a side thing that's happening while you're doing that is you're making a buddy. Like this, uh, this other guy over here with the chainsaw, like this other guy, Mike, I just met him. And he only lives five minutes down the road, but I just found out that we got a lot of things in common. We both like the same music, or we've got kids about the same age. And I met him. How'd you meet him? I'm chainsawing up at this old lady's house after the tornado. And then now we're going to, we're going to end up doing a, a dinner with the whole family. Like that, that's, these are the beginnings of friendships. And so lean into all that stuff. If that's important to you, lean into all this stuff heavily and keep your eyes open. The other, the last thing I'll say is we should always lower our expectations of what we expect from friends. Because if we come in with these high expectations, like any friend of mine that I just meet is going to invite me to dinner. Or they're going to, if I say we're doing game night at our house, they'll say yes every time. That's what I expect from a friend. Lower the expectations. Because we're talking about personalities here. We're not talking about genuine friendships. Sometimes you're just talking about a personality that's like, maybe they're shy. Maybe they don't like to go to game night. They don't like games. <laughs> they like movies. And you won't know that until you're farther down the road with this person. So lower the expectations at first of what you what you need them to do. And then raise raise your own expectations of how you're going to pour into them. Like, I'm going to be the one pouring in. I'm not expecting them to do anything back, but I'm going to pour into them. This is, your, this is a way to build lifelong friends. I appreciate the, the question, Chris. Here's a, uh, gosh, there's a lot. There's so many. Um, here's one. Subject line, meaning of life. Hey, Granger, I'm Nathan from Southern Illinois. I love your podcast, by the way. Can't seem to be happy. I just graduated college with a wildlife management degree. And all I want to do is stay in bed and be alone. I have no friends and I'm single. I just don't see the point of doing anything anymore. I just want to work and come home and go to bed and stay there. I'm a Christian and I do go to church, but I'm just losing hope. The biggest struggle is being single and I just don't know what to do anymore. I feel like you're the only person I could ask. Any advice? Thank you. Nathan, shout out to Southern Illinois. Thanks for listening, buddy. Thanks for emailing. And um, I want to kind of take you back to the very first question I did on this episode where I said, you're, it sounds like you're doing a lot of work here from, from a Christian perspective, but there's not a lot of surrender. It's like, I'm, I'm doing this and this and this and this, but I'm not getting anything back from God. And so I'm just ready to give up. And, and God goes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> give up. That's what, that's what I need you to do. I need you to surrender it to me. So everything I said in that first question, apply this to you. I also want to say that um, you're depressed. This is depression. And and a lot of times when you're clinically depressed, and it sounds like you're clinically depressed, you're saying you're saying all the things that would lead me to believe that's, you know, all you want to do is be in bed and be alone. And you don't see a point of anything anymore. And you can't seem to be happy. These are all the the definitions of depression. And so Sometimes you got to see a doctor because because sometimes there's things that are chemically mixed up and a doctor can go, "Yep, got it. We could we could fix this." And it's something that it's not about um therapy or you know, you don't have to see a a shrink or anything. Sometimes it's just like, "Oh yeah, you you're doing this." You you know, I was thinking about this today. I I flew last night from I can't even remember where I was. I was in North Lawrence, Ohio, and we drove this morning. We had a a 3 a.m., 4 a.m. lobby call in our hotel, and that's an Eastern time. So we were, our bodies felt like it was 3 a.m., 
and I had an early flight the morning before that. And then we drove from North Lawrence to Cleveland to jump on a plane for a 5.30 flight, and we came home. And all day, I was just so tired. Like, I couldn't do anything. All I wanted to do was be in bed and be alone, and there was no meaning, and I wasn't happy. I was kind of saying your same email today. And I was just thinking, man, sleep is such a big deal. Like, sleep sleep is such a big deal for me and you. And And I've known this for as long as I've been touring and having early flights and up all nighters, driving home or whatever we're doing. I have learned over the years that, why am I feeling this way? Oh, yeah, I didn't sleep last night. Boom. One good night's sleep fixes it. I don't think that's what you're going to say. I don't think that that's going to fix it. But I do want to bring up that sometimes there's things that are that are impairing our sleep in some way that we don't know about. Like maybe you have a, a sinus thing or you're, you have a snoring thing or a tonsil problem or there's something underlying that's going on. Maybe you just don't have a good mattress. I'm, I know that that sounds petty, but if you're not getting enough sleep or consistent sleep or deep sleep and you're sleeping lightly or you're tossing and turning, maybe it's anxiety, whatever it might be. If you're not getting enough sleep, your days are going to suck and you're, you just don't see things with, through, with a clear lens and everything seems bad. I'm telling you that feeling like that right now, like that's why I'm fumbling through this podcast because I feel that now. But but I've done it long enough to know myself and know that I'm just you know that you know that they say that when you when you're missing sleep to so many degrees it's equivalent to being drunk on alcohol. Like your brain is functioning so slow and so numb, it's equivalent to however many hours of sleep you miss is like equivalent to how many drinks of alcohol you could have had. It's crazy. And yet we drive like this, but it's it's just like drunk driving when you're going on no sleep. Everything else in your life is the same. So I've, I've thrown a lot of information at you, Nathan. Um, but I think the most important thing I could say is if you're really at the end of your rope here, surrender it to God. Stop trying to work through it because you can't. God, take it. Take it. And make sure that 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 is on, you're on your knees, and you're just you're just face down, just throwing it up at him. Yeah. Next question, subject line says, "How to fall in love?" Hey Granger, I'd like to stay anonymous. I'm 22. I recently started dating a boy who I have been close friends with for a while, and I've always liked things about him, but I was hesitant to date him due to distance. He has many great qualities, and he's helped me grow closer to God during our friendship. I find myself struggling with the idea of love and marriage. He seems so sure about me, but I struggle with consistency. How do I know if I love him? I've been a listener for a while now, and I know that you say that I know you say someone can know if they get married in one year. What I think what you mean is by one year of dating, you could know if you're going to marry him. Do you think that that still applies for long distance? We communicate all the time and we try to see each other monthly. I'm very thankful for you and your campfire conversations. God bless. Thanks, Anonymous. 22, dating, long distance, and not sure. Um, here's the thing, Anonymous. Love, love is something... You said, let, let me focus on one sentence that you wrote. How do I know if I love him? Let's just, we could, we could really throw out everything else, long distance, the time, your age, um, who he is, what he's done for you, how he's gotten you closer to God. We, we could throw all of that out and focus on one sentence. I'll highlight one thing. How do I know if I love him? And that question is thousands of years old. And it's always answered the same way over thousands of years. If you know, you know. That's how you know. You never have to ask a question of, do I love him? Do I love her? The answer always is, I know I do. My knees are weak. I can't eat. I can't sleep. It's all I think about. I crave this person. I just want to be around them. 
I would do anything. I would lay my life down for them. I want their well-being over mine. I want them to be happy more than I want to be happy. I get choked up just thinking about this person because, because I want the, if they ever got sick, that's way worse than me getting sick. I want them to get better faster than I ever would want to get better. That's, that's when you know. You just know. You don't have to ask. There's not a list or a, a checklist or a, a, a bunch of boxes you got to click off. You just know. And if you ask the question, always, if you have to ask the question, how do I know I love them? The answer coming back to you is, you don't. You don't love them because you're asking the question. Because if you did, you would say, I am in love with them. Just the way it is. It doesn't mean anonymous that you can't grow into love from where you are now. So I'm not saying quit it because you could grow into it. I'm just saying it's a pretty, pretty bad sign if you don't know yet and it's been a year and it's long distance. So although it's not done, it could be. And you could easily walk out, walk away right now and go, I think I need some time. I think I need a break. And the honest, honest answer would be, I'm just not sure if I love you. You are. You're sure. And I'm not sure if I love you back. And that is wrong for me to drag you along like this and make you, make you stay working on this relationship long distance when I'm keeping you away from life. Because to be honest with you, I just don't know if I love you. And it's so hard to tell somebody that, but that's the best thing you could tell them. That's, that is the most beneficial thing they could hear. It's also very hurtful, but it's very good for their well-being to be able to stop it now and say, good, got it, moving on, thank you for being honest. You didn't drag this out any longer. That's my answer. Thank you for the question, Anonymous. All right, let's, let's hit another one here. Subject line, asked her to marry me and she left. My girlfriend for over a year ghosted me. And I asked her to marry me. After I asked her to marry me, it's been two weeks. She hasn't texted me since I asked her to marry me. It's been very hard, and I've had lots of stress and anxiety. I come from a hard childhood, and I never wanted to marry anybody until I met her. But we've been having a, a little bit of a rough patch, and when I asked her to marry me, she said she just thought it wasn't the rest, the best time. She told me the ring wasn't the one she expected, and I knew that, and I explained that I would buy her the exact ring that she wanted uh, whenever I had more money. And I had other financial hardships that needed my attention. That's why I couldn't buy, the, buy her the exact one at the moment. I haven't heard from her since, and I haven't said any of this out loud until now. And I need help, brother. Much love. A question comes from Frank. And Frank, man, there is, there is, there is just red flags all over your email, brother. And I, I want to help you. I want to help you. And I, then I'm going to go straight to it, straight to the point. Any girl that says that she can't marry you or accept a proposal because it's not the exact ring that she wanted is not the exact girl that you need. Because a girl that truly loves you and sees the vision in you and sees who you are and who the husband that you will become, that girl that sees that and loves you will take a wooden stick on her finger. She'll take a rubber ring. It doesn't matter. She doesn't need the perfect diamond right now because she sees who you are. She knows, she should know, that yes, you're going through financial hardship. And yes, you can't afford the exact ring, but she also believes that you will be one day. You're not him yet, but you will be one day. And she believes in you and she sees that. And she loves you for who you are right now. And she loves you for who you will become because she believes that you will be. And she wants to trust you with that. She wants to trust you with her heart and trust you with children that you might have, God willing. And trust you with the rest of her life, regardless of the ring regardless of financial hardships, regardless of your hard childhood that you grew up in. And you will find a girl like that. And this isn't her. So although 
It's tough. She ghosted you. She dumped you. She left you after you asked her to marry you. Good on you because now you know. Now you know it wasn't the right girl. It doesn't make it, this heartache isn't going to be easier because I'm telling you this, but it should help you understand why you're hurting and why she left and more importantly, why you're going to be better without her. So it's going to be tough right now, but a little bit of time goes by and you go, as you start thinking more with your brain and not your heart, time goes by and you think, man, I'm glad I got out of that one. I'm glad I'm not with that girl anymore. And you'll meet a girl, heart of gold, sweetheart, loves you. And she's like, baby, I just, I I would marry you no matter what kind of ring you gave me. You don't have to give me a ring. We'll go to, we'll go to Toys R Us and get, (laughs) they don't even have Toys R Us. We'll go to Chuck E. Cheese and we'll go to the machine and get a rubber ring. I don't care. Give me a plastic ring. And you're going to think, man, I'm lucky to get past that old, that other girl I had because that's not her. And you'll be more grateful for the new one too. You'll be, you'll be good, Frank. You'll be in a good place. This is, a, this is all happening. This kind of suffering is not meaningless. It has a purpose. In fact, all suffering has a purpose. It's a lot of times we fail to see it. But this has purpose in it. This has meaning. I feel it. Things are going to be good for you, brother. Thanks for the email. And thanks, you, thanks for all the emails, guys. I love doing this. Even when I'm going on no sleep, I love doing these podcasts. And I love y'all. And we'll see you next Monday. Yee yee. Thanks for joining me on the Granger Smith Podcast. I appreciate all of you guys. You could help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to this channel. Hit that little like button and the notifications bell so that you never miss any time I upload a video. If you have a question for me that you would like me to answer, email grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. Yee yee.